Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome from the Zacatapult. Um, a big welcome to all of you who are here in the auditorium today, and also for those joining us online. Thank you for connecting uh, to find out more about um, the key insights from the Mobile World Congress. I am Linda Ligio, City Innovation Partner and Team Lead at Digital Catapult, and I'm really excited that once again, uh, we partner with Women in Telecoms and Technology to bring you this event. Um, the uh, WIT, as we call it, they have uh, run a post-mobile Congress event for the last 12 years, and we also hosted it last year, and they really want to bring you insights, especially for those who were not able to um, attend the Congress in Barcelona. I was actually one of the lucky ones who walked over 20,000 steps each day to make the most of the venue. There were so many amazing innovations there, but I trust me tonight, you'll hear a great deal of insights from our amazing panel, which will be shared by Michelle Senecal de Fonseca, who is board of director for WIT. Um, and just as, as I show you the agenda here, you'll also there will also be an opportunity for a Q&A at the end of the panel uh, for both our online audience and, and those who are present today. And after that, we have organized for those in the auditorium uh, a special tour of our Sony Labs, which is our, uh, the cutting edge facility uh, here at Digital Catapult. Um, and I'll tell you more about what we do there. And there will also be a networking session at the end uh, with Ring. So stay with us until the end. And uh, before we get started, I just want to give you a quick overview for those who don't know us about this catapult. So we're part of a network of uh, catapults spread out across the country. We are world leading technology and innovation centers with a mission to accelerate industry adoption of advanced digital technologies. Um, and really, we want to create new opportunities through collaboration and innovation, uh, bringing together a very wide range of stakeholders from startups, uh, corporates, we work with academia, um, the government, of course, and we really want to make sure that we can accelerate this journey. How do we do it? First of all, we design and deliver uh, acceleration programs that are aligned to industry challenges and themes. We also, of course, do lots of like innovation consultancy for, for companies who, who require that. We build test beds facilities where we can run proof of concepts, pilots, and also test new business models. And we also facilitate R&D projects. We are currently actually putting uh, forward some proposal for Horizon Europe. We're very happy that it is back. And we inform also policy recommendations and lead research on emerging tech trends. So ultimately, what we want to do is break down barriers and de-risk innovations, opening up new markets, focusing on three main technology application layers. We support visualization and cyber physical systems, we help deliver, uh, develop digital and resilient supply chains, and we drive open and interoperable digital infrastructures. And we do it by um, applying lots of business and technical expertise across uh, various technologies. Uh, of course, they include feature networks, so 5G and IoT, but we also work across artificial intelligence and machine learning, distributed ledger technologies, uh, quantum, and we're always on the lookout for, of course, new, new technology and see where we can uh, bring you the latest advances. We... Um, just to the next slide, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of our journey so far in telecom. Since 2015, we've collaborated uh, with more than 200 partners, delivering more than 30 cutting edge award-winning projects. And uh, we have supported more than 650 organizations, primarily SMEs, um, and we really, Kind of try to um, uh, bring our expertise. We have a very strong team of 30, 30 technical experts, just those focalized on, on telecom. But of course, we have expertise across the other areas that I've mentioned. And because today we, there is um, a tour of the lab, and, and I'm really keen to tell you more, I just got one slide here to tell you more about Sony Labs. This project has been developed in collaboration with Ofcom, and we fund it from the Department for Science, Innovation, and Technology. And really, the main goal is to support the 5G supply chain diversification strategy to accelerate the introduction of new open network products into the UK, starting with Open RAN. 
Now, some of you might not be familiar with this terminology, so I'm going to briefly try to explain it. I'm not here a technology expert, but basically in the telecom infrastructure, you've got the RAN, which is the radio access network. This is the large and most ex expensive part of our mobile network, which connect all the user devices to the core services where all the data is basically processed. Now, traditionally, there's been three main suppliers um, of proprietary equipment. Um, so Open Run, what Open Run is doing is basically, this is a revolutionary new way of building mobile networks where we take, we, we, we can take basically interchangeable systems, so disaggregating components of the RAN uh, from a variety of vendors. So this enable kind of to break away from uh, vendor locking and, and also uh, add the greater flexibility and innovation potential in telecoms. This is also because there is a new component which I personally am fascinated by, which is the run intelligence controller on top of which you can build new intelligence applications. You might hear a little bit more about this in a second. So what is Sony Labs? Sony Labs is not only our leading innovation and ecosystem engagement program through which we encourage experimentation, we really bring people together to collaborate and, and share knowledge, but it's also, as I said earlier, a commercially neutral interoperability testing facility. And what we do there, you will hear more in, um, from our team in the lab, we basically take early stage standalone products, we integrate them, and we test the end-to-end -end system, um, are helping those products to be ready for commercial conformance and pre-production testing. Ultimately, our goal is to encourage innovative vendors to enter uh, the UK and, and to really make sure that the supply chain, if the supply chain is resilient, competitive, and accessible for new market entrants. Now, as part of this program, this year, we are very delighted also to announce our new program because we wanted to encourage also new, new products to be, to be developed and, and also help the um, SME community, all the startups and scale-ups that are out there and they've got a very strong transferable skills. So this program, and there is currently an open call live, uh, will be an eight months structure pro program where we will do some experimentation, but also provide business support to the companies. And really the idea is to develop, but also implement solutions uh, focusing on, in particular, on the energy efficiency as one of the key challenges for mobile network operators, because as you know, the run is quite, it consumes lots of, uh, of energy. So we're going to try to do some exper experimentation there and the two main themes. The first one is the run intelligence controller enab uh, enabled advanced sleep modes. And the second one is about looking at how we can optimize the power utilization of the central unit and distributed unit. I know those, are, those, might, those might be some kind of um, new technology, but as I said earlier, they are the components of the run, uh, of the open run infrastructure. Um, so, and I think I just want to tell you, for those especially also connected online, you can find out more um, on our website. There is a QR code here uh, displayed on the screen, and the deadline for application is the 22nd of March. So if anyone is interested, please uh, don't forget to uh, apply. And I think with this, it's all from me for now. Um, I just want like to now introduce um, Michelle Senecal de Fonseca, who is going to bring this on stage, welcome on stage the panel. We've got an amazing lineup of speakers. Thank you. Um, and um, yeah, we'll uh, look forward to hearing more. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Well, on behalf of the WIT directors, a very warm welcome to having you here, both online and in the room. Um, for those of you who this might be your first opportunity to have come to one of these events, uh, could I introduce our directors at the back, our chairman, uh, Audrey, <laughs> she's waving there, <laughs> okay. Uh, Yasmin, here in front, Annette. Unfortunately, Helen is not here this evening, um, but we're actually quite uh, blessed by having the founder of WIT herself and our past chair, Stephanie Liston, who's here this evening. So good to have you back with us. And I really have to give it to Stephanie as a hand because when we started this organization almost 24 years ago, telecommunications was the focus. Even though we had women in telecom and technology, it really was telecom. And this was our preeminent event because we found that women 
didn't get the tickets to go to Mobile World Congress. It was the CEOs, or if you were going to be on working on the stand, they actually went and hired models, and those are the ones who got to go. It wasn't necessarily the people in the company themselves. And so we needed this opportunity to find out what was going on, and it's moved around to different cities over the years. So I'm really pleased that uh, we've got some great speakers here this evening. So if I could uh, have our three panelists come join me up on stage, that would be great. Uh, me too here. All right. Uh, Teresa, why don't you join her here in the middle? Why don't you join me, Sophie? Great. Now, these three ladies have probably the longest job titles of anybody I know. <laughs> and it would not do me justice to try to explain it. So I've asked each one of them to tell us, introduce themselves, tell a little bit about what they're doing and particularly what they're doing with their organization, just so you have a context of um, why they're here on the panel tonight. So Sophie, we're gonna start with you since you're sort of one of the hosts today. Of course, so uh, hi everyone, my name is Sophie Weston. I'm a senior policy research and engagement manager at Digital Catapult, uh, predominantly working on the Sonic Labs project. Um, I mean, Linda pretty much covered what Digital Catapult does, so I feel like I've got a safe bet in, uh, in what Linda did. But um, within Sonic Labs, I look at the strategic engagement perspective. So working with industry, um, specifically the telecoms industry, um, the UK government, academia, other um, testing facilities like Sonic Labs, uh, along with our um, industry groups that we have within Sonic Labs that looks at um, the MNOs, other testing facilities and wireless infrastructure providers. But I'll touch more on that later on in the panel. Great. Teresa. Hello, my name is Teresa Walsh. I'm the Chief Intelligence Officer and Managing Director of EMEA Business Relations for FSISEC, which is a very long acronym. Basically, we're a membership organization of financial institutions, and we specialize in cyber risks. So part of what my team does is look at all the different types of cyber threats and fraud threats and all types of threats that are affecting our membership and how we can uh, better help them understand the threat landscape. Me too. And good evening. Um, so good to be here. What a treat it is for me. Um, my name is Neetu Koshal. Um, I'm based out of London and I'm the managing director for the Accenture Intelligent Edge practice. So what this means is we get to work in environments that require real time outcomes where milliseconds matter. And Accenture brought me in uh, two years ago to catch the next wave of growth for cloud, which we see to grow at 35% year on year. So we're kind of incubating this emerging technology and seeing what it can really do across retail, industrial, life sciences, um, and all of the different automotive industries as well. So we're working right the way across these uh, different environments. So taking the, the history of 23 years plus in tech and telco and applying it to the actual industries themselves. And we're sending our good wishes to Sarah Roberts, who is also going to be joining us. She was the chief marketing officer at Bolden Networks who uh, woke up quite ill this morning. So <laughs> she might be listening online. So we get, send her her best. Now, I think you all recognize Mobile World Congress. Uh, it's an opportunity for everybody in this industry to get together, but also the other connected industries that have an influence and have a, a requirement on connectivity moving forward. And through all the years, it's changed quite a bit. Uh, for those of you, how many of you have ever attended in the, in the past? Good, all right. Um, the numbers, I just have a couple of them because I think it's quite interesting. There was a question after COVID, would we come back strong and would people really want to feel the need that we needed to come together in, in Barcelona? But this year over, I was 101, excuse me, 100,000, uh, can't even speak uh, English here this evening, 101,000, there we go, persons attended and the attendance was up 14% from the year before, it was around uh, 88,000 individuals. And from the people that I've talked with, they felt like the mojo had come back and there was this real sense of opportunity and people wanted to be together. Um, 1,100 speakers and thought leaders and the number that blows me away is 40% of them are female. Now, if you've known what we've been working with the GSM for so many years to try to get enough women on panels and we're very fortunate, Teresa is actually one of those thought leaders uh, that were there this year. And 
Uh, twenty six percent of the attendees this year were female. That too is kind of running a little bit average or even above average for our industry. So I would say that over the decades that we've been engaged with that, it's finally moving in the right direction. And that's, I'm starting to wonder though, is that because we have so many side industries that are also being involved, but I don't really care. It really starts to show that there's an engagement and then we have people who are looking at it. Now, I'm sort of curious, you all have very different backgrounds. What drives you to Mobile World Congress? And what is it that you hope to get out of it when you go there? Sophie, this is your first or second time? Second, second time, time going. Um, and it was even better than last year, I must admit. Um, it was great to see, first of all, women, you know, representation of women there, especially with keynote speeches and the sessions that I attended specifically on um, Open RAN and 5G. Uh, we've we've known you know women in telecoms has been limited previously, but it's great to see that it's it's growing now and there's more around that. Sure. Um, obviously, I suppose to showcase uh, showcase the work that we do within Sonic Labs, um, but it's just a learning experience for me. It's just understanding what the key trends are um, at Mobile World Congress. We know it's one of the well one of the world biggest congresses uh, out there, so. Um, each year, I'm really interested to find out, you know, what the key trends are. Um, there's a couple of them that I'll, I'll go through later, but um, it, it's great to see that, you know, there's so many more people coming. And as you mentioned, post-COVID, we didn't know where it would go, but mm -hmm. more and more people want to come, which is really great to see. Good. Teresa. Yeah, well, I'm not in telecommunications, so it was a little bit uh, of a duck out of water uh, for me. But, uh, you know, I'm in the financial sector and, and this is uh, the type of world I'm usually used to and the type of conferences I'm usually used to. However, um, in the past several years, we've been talking a lot with GSMA uh, because they do run a telecom ISAC. And for uh, ISAC, for those of you who don't know, is an information sharing and analysis center. And basically what you do is that you look at what's affecting your company. So for FSISAC, it's about what's affecting the financial services, whether you're a bank or a stock exchange or a mortgage company um, in terms of cyber risks. And then uh, for telcos, it's the same thing. Uh, and so we started talking uh, a few years ago and understanding uh, more about what we do together, how we can actually work together. And uh, they said, well, why don't you come and talk about fraud at uh, the Mobile World Congress? And, you know, I said, yes, that'd be great. And then um, it was very op uh, open eyed experience because I had been to big conferences before, but this actually took the cake. And so um, it was a, a very interesting experience. And and really, I go back because of GSMA, because um, they, they are great partners to work with. Super. Thank you. Um, and from our side, um, for us, what edge means is it could be processing in a device. It could mean it could be in a, a gateway. It could be in a server. It could even be in the network. So from our point of view, get, being in Mobile World Congress means we get to be right the way across the chipset makers. We're partnering with the hardware vendors. We're also then looking at what the cloud providers are doing. So all of these latest trends and announcements really matter as we guide our clients in the age of AI and generative AI. The other thing was uh, for me personally this time, it was also being with a, a couple of C-levels that we were helping to negotiate the next round of like their projects and also thinking about what could they also get out of something like Mobile World Congress and, and really align on these strategic meetings that just like you said, Michelle, uh, the power really is when you're there in person and when you've got the right critical mass there, things do happen much faster. Um, so it was an investment from our side on all of those regards. Well, every year, of course, the topics change, but then in our industry, things don't change as quickly as you would imagine. Um, one of the major topics, of course, was 5G and beyond. And I'll digress for just a moment. But 20 years ago, it was the 2023, uh, 20, no, 2024, it was called 3GSM and it was held in Cannes. And I, I remember this because somebody just sent me a little video link of the first and only GSM um, fashion show. It was the tech at the time and the fashion. And luckily we're not using much of either these days because it, it really was uh, something, but you know, 60 models and all sorts of tech and it was really high done. You can find it on YouTube if you wanna go take a look. Um, but you know, that's 3G. 
And here at 5G, and some people say, well, how come we're not talking about 5.5 and 6 and stuff like that? Um, and I think a lot of it has to do because the industry, we're moving a little bit slower in terms of the adoption. And are we really monetizing it in the way that we need to? I imagine that was a big topic of discussion with a lot of your customers, me too. Um, what was what was sort of the trends in the, the topics? I would say 5G still feels very far away for a lot of our clients. Um, they're worried about um, convergence, convergence where you've got brownfield sites. It could be a retail store. It could be a warehouse. It could be a manufacturing plant. These are environments that already have some degree of network. It could be Wi-Fi. It could be Ethernet. Um, it could be some form of cellular. But upgrading to um, a 5G network or a mobile private network still feels like a quite a far reach because these use cases that need to you know sit on top and stack on top that really create all of these new workloads and create the business model that creates a consumption of a 5G network is still quite far away. So we're seeing a quite a mixed, varied degree of requirements from our clients. I'm very happy to um, investigate and trial and incubate different environments. They all have innovation houses as well. So those types of things are happening, but something that requires a, a big scale deployment, uh, we st still see a lot of resistance, mainly because of security security trends and the need for uh, data to really be, um, you know, the sovereign data. So where does the data sit? The residency side of things really matter to our clients. So those types of things are really creating an angle for um, how quickly does the adoption happen? So the adoption needs to happen, but that just the speed at which it happens is a thing that's being questioned. Um, are you finding difference of speed between the public networks and the private? Because I, I tend to believe that there were a lot more demonstration of what you can do on your private network. Uh, at least that's what I was reading from Mobile World Congress. Definitely. We see that uh, 5G is definitely the era of enterprise network. It's really supporting businesses. It's that business-to-business -business environment. Um, so that aspect really gets to scale. So really thinking about how these types of technologies are supporting the different industry verticals, the nuances that these different uh, verticals carry, then needs to be kind of layered on top. Um, so the consumption of that how quickly does that then happen all becomes an important equation of that kind of overall financial model now i know that um, mobile world congress has really been trying to make an effort to you know incorporate a lot of other industries and so they had a connected industry segment focusing on manufacturing um health care i believe was one of them sports and media and of course fintech was you know the one that you know captured your eye and how they attracted you can you um, talk a little bit about what does Mobile World Congress mean to the FinTech organization and what did you speak about? So I was there for a fraud panel and there were several of us from different companies talking about how we need to tackle the fraud space. And, you know, obviously um, all of us have phones. Um, how many people have had a, you know, a, a SMS or a call that was a scam? You know, just show of hands. How many of you got it? <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, this is prolific. I mean, it, it it is everywhere, and in the financial services industry, we also recognize that people's phones are their lives. Um, so whereas before, if you wanted to be more secure and have like a a, a second factor authentication pin number with you, um, it, they, you know, they gave you some other device. You know, when I lived in Germany, they gave me a piece of paper, and <laughs> you know, and uh, when you know it, early on, they would give you a little token. Some people still use tokens, and it's a little device that you quickly lose and um, can't find again. And so now they have it on your phone, and it's an app on your phone, and you you use your phone. You use you know probably hope probably all of you have your mobile banking app on your phone. And so uh, when it comes to interconnected industries, I mean, you can't get more interconnected at this point than the financial services and the telecommunications industry. And so, and when it comes to fraud, we have two sides of the same coin because for a bank, if you're looking at one of your customers and, you know, hopefully not one of you have had uh, yourselves or a loved one be defrauded, but Statistics are yes, 
you have probably more than one of you as well. So um, when we're trying to do this fight, we do need to work together because um, especially for scams, they call it authorized push payments where, you know, you call somebody up and you pretend they're, you know, you, maybe you pretend you're Microsoft, maybe you pretend that you're your own company's IT help desk or, or a bank and they say there's something wrong. You need to move all your money over. And they convince the poor people. Uh, there's actually a TV show in the mid afternoon. If you're ever like, on, you know, on off work and you're poor, there's it, it's an interesting one to watch. And they they go through the whole process about the scam, and it gets so many people. And everybody says it's never going to happen to me, and it does. You know, so many people that even in my industry who know the scams have almost fallen for it or have fallen for it. And so the only way we can fight this is really working together because for our side. We see the customer, but you see it's it's really the customer sending the money. And it's only the telecommunication side that might know that, wait a second, that customer has been on a phone call this whole time and they're sending the money while being on this phone call that maybe is known to be from a scammer. And so if we're not talking to each other, we can't fight the fraud. And so that was the whole conversation is talking about how we can work together as different industries, different types of companies, and you know, hopefully save people some money. Who else was on the panel with you to kind of have this discussion? Oh, it's a pop quiz. Uh, <laughs> um, there were several of us. Um, it was Palo Alto, GSMA was the moderator as well. And um, you had um, uh, Fido uh, and I can't remember the other, uh, the other panelists' names, but basically we all had different parts of the fraud fight. So uh, one company, for instance, um, we talked about how, do, how can you prove it's your customer? Because um, all of your dates of birth um, are online. Um, probably all of your addresses are online. Probably all of your phone numbers are online and your email addresses. And so how can you prove that a person trying to log into your bank account is actually you? And they call it up and say, you know, well, this is my date of birth and this is my address and everything's correct. So how do they prove it's not you? And so their company kind of specializes in, in those types of authentication software, which is very difficult, and especially nowadays. Uh, and then Palo Alto, of course, is a, is a very large um, security company. They make hardware, they make they do a lot on the cybersecurity side and GSMA, of course, being the telecommunications ISAC lead as well. And, uh, and they have spearheaded a lot of these efforts to link the banks and the telecommunications companies together to figure out how to, we could fight fraud as well. And I'm forgetting another one, but I can't, I can't remember who also it was, but it was some, uh, somebody. Uh, or somebody like oh yes, for David from Verizon, that's of course. And so he came from over from the, the U.S. and uh, um, he did uh, talk about some of the things that they're starting to do now in the U.S. because the U.K. actually is the leader in this and they've uh, paved the way on how the telecommunications and the financial institutions can work together to fight fraud. And now they're trying to use that model in other countries, including the United States. That's an interesting cooperation in leading the way because I think that rolls into a lot of why you were there. Yeah. <laughs> fight the fraud sounds like a horror yeah. movie. <laughs> no, um, Lin uh, Linda talked a little bit about, you know, the cooperation needing in the diversification of supply chain. So we're not, you know, we're dependent on just a few different vendors. And so whether you're a private or a public network, I think these are the issues that you're trying to deal with. So um, your key role in attending that was to try to get people on board and to talk to each other. I want to give us a little bit of a rundown of how you succeeded. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so as Linda mentioned, obviously within our role for, for Open Man, um, a, a lot of the sessions that I attended highlighted that, uh, you know, Open Man is key for radio access network infrastructure. Um, but, you know, there were still issues that are highlighted, especially technical challenges around unity and optimization. So, um, it's still imperative that you know we need to open up this telecoms ecosystem for new companies to innovate to not rely on those dominating companies that are in there in the environment at the moment um and we need to allow those those smaller players to enter the field to enable that greater choice of the supply chain and to innovate accordingly so greater choice means you know more flexibility more interoperability and and market competition all these things that a great and positive and something that we should adapt to and be open to so through the work that we were doing at sonic labs you know this is what we were trying to showcase um not just to vendors who might be interested but the ecosystem as a whole and um that ranges from 
both sort of um, international governments, UK governments, uh, well, government, that's not <laughs> governments. Um, some countries. Some, is, but... <laughs> some do, yeah. Um, yeah, academia, other research and development facilities, um, and really push the drive for, you know, open networks and, and innovation. Um, and I think the connections that we made through those last those four days at MWC, you know, we really hit the nail on the head there and a couple of panel sessions that we did, um, especially sort of with global collaborators and driving innovation forward, really trying to send that message home to say, you know, we need to be more open in this. Where else in the world do you find that this is, I mean, it's a problem everywhere, don't get me wrong, but are there some areas uh, or parts of the regions that are more engaged with you on this? Uh, yes, yeah, so the work that we've been doing within um, Sonic Labs, we've um, we've had quite close relationships with the likes of the US, um, Germany, Taiwan are very interested. You know, we know that um, Japan are obviously leading leading the forefront in in, in technology, but um, it, for our role and specifically my role, speaking with these different countries, these different organizations to find out where they are on their journey in technology and open RAN. And the main question being, how can we collaborate? How can we work together on this? Because it is about, you know, wider market competition, but you need to work together to push this. Open RAN is still a newish technology and, you know, the likes of 5G has been around for, for some time and no doubt there will be 6G and 7G and so on. Um, but Open RAN's, you know, part of this new, for the radio access network architecture, Open RAN is the, is the innovation and the, the need to drive this forward. So collaborating, not just within the UK, but other countries as well, and, and showcasing that is, is what we need to do. So yeah, the, we've had lots of positive conversations so far. Um, and the time at MWC, different countries that we spoke with are also keen to, to work with the likes of the UK and Sonic Labs as well. It's really important to have a champion for, you know, the mid-market and smaller, but do you also have some bigger players who are jumping in and, and supporting this? Or do you find that uh, maybe some of the bigger vendors don't really want to participate? Um, just put me on the spot there. <laughs> Um, no, I think we, the discussions, we've had discussions, I suppose, with with bigger players and trying to find out, you know, where they are in their journey. But now's the time to allow the smaller vendors to come in and, and you know, for them to, to be able to provide a greater choice and more flexibility. And this is what we do at Sonic Labs. We bring in the smaller vendors and, and let them test their equipment and, and test their measurement platforms and, um we've had some positive feedback from those vendors to say without the work of Sonic, we wouldn't be here. And that's really great to see. So the, we're then trying to push that forward and um, showcase that work. So uh, the conversations, I suppose, with, with more dominating players um, has not been, it's not been negative, but uh, it's just figuring out where they are and where we can join them on that journey. <laughs> well done. Well, no newspaper, uh, radio discussion or just you know talking with your friends doesn't come up with but the number one topic which I'm sure was also quite prevalent at Mobile World Congress and that is artificial intelligence. It is the most adapted or adopted technology uh, in history and I just think there is a lot of marketing hype on it right now. I'm kind of curious how did you feel about where AI was being discussed at Mobile World Congress? Nita, you probably talked about it most because you know your customers have are probably saying, I know the answer is AI, but what is the question? <laughs> what were the conversations that you had with your clients? If I cast my mind back, um, when our clients were asking us, um, okay, so what type of infrastructure is right for me to support the environment I have? It really was led with an infrastructure direction and a network. Then came in the developers that came in with great applications, maybe all cloud native. And then they came in with the requirements of what needs to sit on top of a network and what the, um, and the infrastructure and what the network needs to support. But I guess what's changing now is it's what can AI do for me? 
and and what will those workloads look like? So how can you design an infrastructure and a digital core with your network if you don't know what these workloads are going to be? And I guess with the advent of generative AI and everyone's got really excited since March last year, we've all had that same experience of a smartphone again, where we've all had an a, a in-person experience of what could this really mean for me? And I think that's why it's on the mind of every sea level for every board that we go to um, and we advise it, it's on everyone's mind. It's actually, what should I be doing? What are my opportunities? What are my risks? And what could I be trying right now in a very safe way? So in that vein, it's still very small trials, small POCs, but everyone is open to trying it. We ran a survey across over 2,000 um, sea levels in the last three months, and 98% of them were open to trying something to see where could the impact be made across their business. Um, so with that, we, we do see the demand is there, but you know we still have to then be practical because our current environments don't necessarily allow for that. And AI, I guess, you know there are different grades of AI. We know the AI of Netflix that just suggests things to you. Uh, then, there's, then there's the AI of um, uh, slightly more deep learning, which takes in not just maybe some historical things that you've searched for, but actually looking at objects and maybe voice recognition, so taking in a lot of external data but then we start thinking about generative ai it's taking in data from lots of other third parties external data so you know our clients are also thinking you know i don't want bad data to be infused in my good data so i've got to put some guardrails in place to make sure that whatever i am trying and testing whether it's in sales or marketing or operations or call centers it, it better be good data so there's a lot of that going on right now that we see across industries but one thing i would say on this topic is uh, we ran a session for the first time at Mobile World Congress on um, industrials. And this was really focused on manufacturing um, because, you know, they've been part of Industry 4.0 for, for quite some time. Their environments are heavily infused with connected sensors and devices and machines. So this is a place that's a good fertile territory to want to deepen and advance and leverage AI. And what we're seeing is, is um, in the past where we're thinking about maybe just connected sensors and looking at patterns and how you could improve your local plant environment, then the age of the cameras, taking in computer vision data and looking at vast amounts of new data uh, in these physical environments. But now also then thinking about the role of the network because that's been eliminated so far. It hasn't quite been incorporated. But if you then think about the role of the network and the thousands and hundreds of thousands of different data points you could infuse in your models, then in an on-premise environment, you could have a lot of automation just within your own premises and your own good data. So I'll give you an example, a manufacturing company like um, you may know it, who makes uh, nice sweets that might all be colored in one packet. They're looking at, um, actually, you know what? We have a lot of uh, wasted of material. We, we sometimes put too many sweets in a packet and sometimes we don't put enough. And when we put too much, we're giving away raw material. But when we don't put enough, we're actually creating a bad customer experience. So how do I you know, really make that happen? So just to answer that one question around reducing the amount of raw materials to make all of these um, different sweet packets, you're analyzing different production lines, you're looking at camera data, you're looking at data from connected sensors on your machines, you're also then infusing it with your network data to, to create fully autonomous digital twins. So that doesn't just happen. It happens because you've collected a lot of information. So, you know, the advent of different AI models and how they're driven on top that really get to advance in this space. So this is the part that we're really excited about. And we talked about the rise of AI in industrial, and that was a big focus for us. Well, AI in the financial sector, is it moving as fast as the fraudsters? 
Well, uh, we're moving cautiously because I think with anything, um, you know, there's opportunity, but there's also risk. And I think, uh, you know, especially in my area where we're cyber security, we're literally paid to be paranoid. So, um, you know, we're always looking at the potential worst case solution and how the bad guys can use it. And, you know, are the bad guys using it? Yes, they absolutely are. And, and they don't need to stop and talk to the boardroom first before they get permission to do it. And, um, and this is something that has always been an advantage to them. Uh, and a disadvantage to us because we're always on the back foot then and trying to almost chase after how we do it. Um, but in terms of opportunities, I mean, there's uh, plenty of opportunities as well, especially on the fraud fund front where you can um, try to get some of these tools to tell you, for instance, um, because nowadays since COVID especially, um, you can open up a bank account without ever having to step foot into a branch. And, you know, there are actually now fintechs that specialize in that. They don't have any physical um, uh, footprint that you can actually visit. And so uh, you do it all online, but then how do you prove that you're you, you know, if it's all online and, you know, when nowadays you can literally put somebody else's face on and you can, you know, be Rishi Sunak for a day and, you know, just kind of talk about it to different friends and call them up and wish them happy birthday and, and, you know, things like that. And, and so, but what if you try to open up a bank account? What if you try to remortgage your house? And you try to use that same type of technology. And so, um, but the same tools that the bad guys can use against us, um, well, the good guys can actually use to try to detect that as well. And so there are things called like liveness checks where they, uh, instead of having like a, a picture of somebody and you try to say, this is me, they, they are literally looking to see what your movements are. You know, sometimes you can tell like a fake picture that has been Photoshopped. Um, we won't go into the recent photoshopping, but uh, but you can you can you can tell like certain things are off. You know, maybe the their the lighting around their face doesn't look quite right. Um, it looks almost a little bit cut off, especially the hands. AI tends to have very uh, big problems with the hands. You know, they look all distorted and and you know um, you know it, it it it's fake, not real. But um, so there are different ways to try to detect that. Um, but, you know, like with any new technology, you know, it's here to stay, uh, but, um, you know, definitely have the opportunities and the risks that I think, you know, we're, we're all scared about, we're, but we're all trying to figure out how to, how to prevent it before the bad guys figure out what next to do with it. Thinking about, you know, having a little Botox or something. <laughs> <laughs> I like the filters, don't get me wrong. <laughs> are you using AI in something else at all? Uh, so... Yeah, so basically, um, I'll just briefly touch on obviously about the speakers that at the sessions that I went to. So a lot of them emphasised about the role that AI will play in helping to transform telecommunications networks. And um, the figure I have um, from a report, EY's report that was published, is the combination of AI and five G is projected to contribute over fourteen trillion to the global economy by twenty thirty five. That's massive. That's massive. Um, and as, as Linda mentioned before, um, you know, Digital Catapult, we have priority areas that are dedicated purely to future networks and artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, so I, I kind of see AI as uh, similar to telecoms, like a horizontal layer. So it will play, you know, this role across many other prior, priority areas, um, fintech, for example, you know, manufacturing, etc. And as Linda mentioned, obviously we had the techno we have the technology access program, um, you know, looking to unlock innovation, accelerate adoption of open RAN in the UK. Um, but specifically on the the first theme or the first phase, um, we will be looking at exploring um, the development of AI driven applications in particular uh, to run on what we call the RAN intelligence controller. So Rick Short um, and those platforms to improve sort of energy efficiency, which is a massive priority at the moment for the telecoms industry. Um, you know, as an R&D initiative and a, as an authority, we, we try and see where the key trends are and how they can be, how they can be implemented sorry, into our sectors. So um, for me in telecoms, you know, looking at how AI can be implemented. Um, and that was what AI is such a hot topic. I feel like I should get it tattooed on me because everyone's saying about AI. So. Um, but yeah, that that's sort of the role that we're playing within Digital Catapult and Sonic in particular. Well, I read that, um, you know, obviously AI, in order for it to work well, your network APIs have to be, you know, 
quite good, and GSMA made an announcement, something about an open gateway allowance or alliance, and they had a hackathon that week, and I read that they had 47 different service providers representing 65% of the global mobile connections already commercially launching these APIs in the open gateway. Do you know anything about it? Is that something that Digital Catapult's been involved in or aware of? Um, so, you know, open networks is sort of the direction of travel for us. Um, Digital Catapult is is certainly interested in that direction of travel, especially for the industry and the, the ecosystem. Um, and I suppose that's why Sonic Labs is starting with Open RAN in particular. You know, we're looking at what um, the RIC can offer in terms of innovation opportunities. So for us, we'll be looking at it with interest and, you know, see where the industry does take this, especially with network APIs. Um, and we have sort of the platforms within Sonic Labs to help support that development for for smaller vendors as well. So we're keeping an eye on it at the moment. I understand in the stand, Orange, the network company, had uh, mm. did something very unique about fraud. No. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm not testing. Please. My mic microphone. Sorry. Okay. We'll just swap oh, around here. No problem. <laughs> um, Orange had demonstrated some of the open AIs all around fraud. I mean, what are you seeing in the development in this area that can support your mission? Yeah, there's a lot of good actually act activity going on between the financial institutions and the uh, mobile network operators on this area because, as I mentioned in some of my examples, that uh, you know if if your um, you know 90 year old um, uh, grandmother got duped by a scam and they're calling up their bank to make a big transfer out of all of their life savings, basically, um, there is a way now to kind of try to figure that out. And so um, it's, but it's something that came about of collaboration and talking about first, what, you know, how can we even analyze this problem first? You know, what's, what's going on? What are the patterns that the bad guys use? How can we use that to identify, you know, um, the abnormal behavior that you might see from a customer? Um, there are some customers that transfer all the time, some customers that maybe barely ever transfer anything. Um, and, you know, trying to use that in a layered approach because it, you know, there is no one simple solution. It has to be a lot of different solutions on top of each other. And, um, you know, also you, you can't forget customer service um, because, you know, I know my husband, for instance, uh, will get sometimes like fraud, you know, warnings from, you know, his bank and he, he gets really frustrated. And I'm like, you know, it's okay. You know, they're trying to do their job. They're trying to protect you. It can be annoying. It can be frustrating. And if you do get it wrong, you might really upset a customer, but if you get it right, you'll save them all the money as well. And so this is why you see a lot of friction sometimes, especially if you are going to make a big purchase of some sort or um, withdraw a large amount of money. There's usually a lot of them, uh, they ask you a series of questions um, to make sure that you're not getting defrauded. But with the APIs, um, they're trying to detect what we can't on the digital space. Because if you're walking into a... Uh, into a branch, the teller can push you to the side and say, hey, I need to ask you these questions just to make sure you're not getting defrauded. If you're doing it online, there is no option. I mean, they can try to, you know, ask you a few questions as a pop-up or something, but, um, you know, you need to be able to kind of detect those things. Uh, you know, is there a set IP address that, you know, the person usually uses? Is, you know, is there some sort of um, maybe um, tool that they can use for device authentication to say, this is this lady's, um, you know, Dell PC, and she's always used it, you know, for the past two years with the same um, type of um, uh, uh, software print, basically. And, and it will be able to say that this is her, but the problems are the scams when it actually is the person, but they're doing a behavior that's not normal for them. And so with these APIs, it's not just the banks trying to figure out, is it, is it or is it not? You know, you can try to then use um, the APIs to hopefully have the telecom industry help you detect whether or not it might be fraud. And in certain cases, especially when you're getting those calls on your phone all the time, that's one of the triggers that you can say, the person's on the phone and they've been on the phone for 20 minutes. They, they received the phone call. They didn't make the phone call. Um, and they're now doing a very abnormal for them large transfer. And that just adds another piece to the puzzle that you really need for the anti-fraud ga uh, game. And so 
Um, this, these are some of the examples of some of the APIs that they're trying to develop now. Unfortunately, there are a lot of use cases to have an API for uh, because there's also the SMS and you know trying to you know um, do what we call SIM swapping. So pretend that you're they're your phone without actually having access to your phone, um, things like that. And so there's there there's a need for these solutions, but we have to work together in order to come up with them. No show would be uh, complete without gadgets, devices. Um, since I wasn't there, these are the ones that I've read about that kind of caught my eye. Um, Motorola's coming up with a rollable smartphone, which can be wrapped around your wrist. Can't be folded, but it can be wrapped around. So that could be interesting. Um, I'm gonna, Xiaomi's Ultra is a new camera heavy phone and it's been revamped with a user interface with AI features, could be interesting. Uh, Samsung has a new Galaxy Ring that you wear. It gives you all sorts of health data and it connects with your phone. I've seen a, a version on the many different startups and crowdfunding entities, so it'll be interesting if a big player comes in and can really uh, sweep out that particular area. Lenovo has a ThinkBook, which is a transparent display so you can see through to the other side of the screen. I'm not really quite sure what the user case is for that, to be honest, but um, interesting concept. Um, the one that really caught my eye, though, is the Humane AI, AI pin. Lovely fashion accessory. Put it on your lapel. Um, this was come up an idea by formal, former Apple executives, and the money came from OpenAI. And it's supposed to be this interactive personal assistant, so you can give it commands. It can help you translate things, give you currency. It also has a camera, so it can look at your food and tell you how many calories and what your nutritional value is. I don't know. I, it better look good before I put it on my jacket. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Um, and then there was a Sky phone that combines both cellular and satellite functionalities in one handset, which really made me start to think about satellites. Was it really discussed much, um, LEOs or anything? Me too. Did you see much about that? I was going to add one more example. Oh, did you see another good one? <laughs> yeah, I thought um, there was one interesting device that I found um, at Mobile World Congress. Um, so imagine you have people who work in the retail front store environment. So they may be um, stocking shelves or they may be a cashier for the day or maybe they're looking at inventory. So these are environments that have high volume of tasks. And an interesting innovation that also that we observed that came through was um, through Google Android's um, operating system innovation, they're able to enable large language models on handheld devices that you could charge up just like a mobile phone. So these are just regular devices, nothing special, but they will not consume more power so that you know they will last a long time but it fundamentally changes the way that people who do their day-to-day -day jobs uh, get to change because now they're empowered with so much more information and it, and it completely changes the way that they operate in an in-store environment so i thought that was quite revolutionary just because of the amount of processing and power that would be needed to support that you would think it would be a lot bigger and it wasn't um, but then going back to your, your question around uh, satellites, um, we are working with clients who are taking in information in a whole new way. So if I start there, imagine a quick service restaurant that is taking now orders by audio. You don't need to type anything in. You go into a quick service restaurant. You, you sometimes get these digital screens and you're putting in your requirements there. You're waiting for your order, whether it be a drive-through or an omni-channel. It, it, it may not matter, but in this environment, if you think about the way that we're taking in orders from consumers, the way we're delivering services to them, we are relying on a lot of data and that digital core matters even more than it ever did before for the telcos who are leveraging um, ai and developing all of these great models from a contact center perspective it would be fundamental big breakdown if they were not able to support their consumers anymore uh, we saw the issue with uh, mcdonald's two days ago where that you know they had their operations issues uh, sainsbury's had an issue where they couldn't do all of their online deliveries for a day they couldn't actually fulfill them 
Um, so in an environment like that, what we're starting to see in terms of um, satellite networks is um, something that kind of supports terrestrial networks. So how do we kind of create something that uh, has zero downtime, has a fundamental switchover if required, but also gets to connect to rural places that were just not easy to connect to before. So with all of the gas stations, we all want to be, um, I guess uh, um, we want to support electric vehicles, but there's a, there's a journey there as well. So imagine all of these rural places that never had that connectivity before. So we're seeing that in environments like that, like an additional supportive network is actually really helpful. So those are some of the trends that we're seeing across the board. Uh, are satellite providers involved in Open RAN at all? Uh, so, uh, on top of my mind, I know there's a couple. So the um, ORANAS project, so it's the only satellite initiative funded by the UK government, and that is their um, future radio access network competition. So um, they're the ORANAS project's main objective is to, I suppose, examine the use of integrate um, use of satellite technology, sorry, in the OPENRAN ecosystem. And then uh, I'm aware that Mavenir are also working with um, a satellite operator in Canada. So I think it's uh, TerraStar Solutions. Um, but they're looking at um, how to integrate satellite connectivity for OPERAN terrestrial networks as well. So it's great to see these initiatives so far. And I, and I hope to see you know more use cases because, as I mentioned, telecoms is horizontal, so it can work with a number of industries. So uh, I'm hoping going forward with the satellite industry as well because it's more connected. You know, one word that when I both talked with you individually and tonight you've used is collaboration, cooperation. I think we all intrinsically understand what that word is, but what does it necessarily mean that you need? I mean, what drove you to Mobile World Congress to say you need cooperation with telcos? Teresa, I'm going to go to you first. What would good look like if you got what you wanted? <laughs> In a perfect world. Um, you know, really, when I reach out to other industries, or especially with GSMA and the Mobile Work Congress, it's because you guys know a lot of stuff that I don't know. And, you know, I I know the financial services side and what we do, but there's so much that I just don't know and how, you know, you know, how my mobile banking app, you know, works and how it bounces through so many signals before it gets to the other side and how many different ways a hacker can actually take advantage of that and maybe disrupt the operation or even get into it. And, you know, those are things that I don't know. And so, it, you know, I, I'm never going to be the smartest person in the world that mem memorizes everything else. So instead, I try to get a network and try to find people who do know that information and try to then um, have them help me and hopefully I can help them back to figure this out. And so that that type of cooperation, I think, is, is really key because you need to be able to uh, work with people of various different types of experiences. And, you know, we're talking about diversity here as well. And, and being able to understand, you know, how can you uh, put different types of people together in order to come up with solutions. And so that's, you know, th that's one of the key w things that I, I found fascinating about Mobile World, World Congress and, and hopefully can go back as again. Cooperation for you? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> in terms of uh, collaboration, so with, with Open Man, it's, it's all I've been going on about this session. Um, but, you know, for industry needs to come together to, you know, seek these joint ambitions, share best practices, um, you know, avoiding repetition and combined the knowledge together, but also, I suppose, knowing our roles and responsibilities in the ecosystem. You know, some of the, some of the work or with Sonic in particular, we're funded by the UK government. So we have, you know, our partnership with government. We have our partnership with the vendors who work in our testing facilities. We have uh, partnerships with trade associations. We have partnerships with academia, you know, international collaborators and we all need to come together to to follow that journey together and th and that's what we have in in sonic in our industry groups in particular so we cover the the mobile network operators here in the uk we cover um testing facilities who are working on open round both in the uk but internationally and the wireless infrastructure providers um so sort of neutral host private networks and things like that um you know these these people are vital in this open round journey and it's a chance for for 
for people and companies to come together to share their lessons learned so other companies can take those lessons and integrate them into their own journeys and say you know what that wouldn't have happened unless I spoke to this person uh, and with Sonic that's what, what we're trying to do and bring people together but it, it's imperative you know collaboration is crucial and and it does deliver value and so without it you know the the delivery of open man or deployment may be a slower process um and this is the next big thing in terms of diversification and future networks so we want to see this really succeed and you can't do that without collaboration me too I, i'm going to start with we want it all <laughs> um look uh, look, how can you design something for the future if you don't really know what you want today? And um, those parameters are changing. So the days where we could design something and it would last for three to five years and you think it would be the right foundation, IT directors, CIOs, CTOs are very worried about making that decision because they know two years down the line, they might already be thinking about the next advent of what their network infrastructure platform might look like. So what I would say is, is if we think about the client in mind first, what's the voice of the customer? It's really about how can we have the most agile and flexible way of making choices, a way that works with my business model because the days of huge CapEx outlay are gone. So how can I really adopt a more consumption-based model, a, a technology digital core that adapts with me as my needs change? And I think that's the main thing that we kind of really require all the way up the stack. Well said. I'd like to open it up. Any questions from either online, Audrey, or from this room? Yes, hi. Uh, there'll be a mic right behind you. There you go. Could you stand Hi. up and just say your name, where you're uh, from? Yeah, Vicky Messer, uh, VP of Product Management at Picocom. Um, we do 5G chips. Uh, we're based in Bristol. Um, so I was just wondering um, for how you think, particularly Sophie, um, <laughs> how you think uh, um, with 6G, what's going to be different with open ram because i think some of the interfaces are going to change and in 5g we saw a lot of disaggregation and lots of new interfaces divided by likes of oran alliance but at 6g it might all change again and i just wondered what role are you looking beyond to 6g and beyond so um, Sonic is obviously, well, Digital Catapult is looking at future networks, but a part of Digital Catapult is also, um, I suppose, sort of the sister program of UK TIN, which is also looking at um, 6G and beyond. There's a number of working groups that they've got going on. Um, so do take a look on online. But um, I suppose, uh, yeah, UK TIN primarily under Digital Catapult will be the ones that um, will focus on that. Uh, personally for me I'm, I'm not involved but we have a number of colleagues in this room who are heavily involved in in UK TIN so uh, I'm sure they'll be able to answer your questions. Sophie will introduce you over cocktails afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, hi my name is Shaba. I am with Digital Catapult in the innovation practice team. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I do have one question for Neetu and Teresa. It's around um, what you mentioned about AI and integration of AI with telecoms, especially finance. Um, is that now that we do have a data surplus, uh, you mentioned that a lot of companies are trying to integrate current AI tools already out there. But since we have such a huge data surplus from sensors, from other modes of data collection, are there are companies or our vendors thinking of training their own uh, generative AI models? Because I do see a trend of that with now a lot of startups starting to think about, okay, how can we use the open APIs for our businesses? So, yeah. I'll just switch this on again. Um, we see a lot of self-build, by the way, especially with the financial institutions. So we're supporting them in creating their own platforms. So it, it's, I think chat GPT or generative AI as a concept is great, um, but people want to control where that information really comes from. So kind of building their own core 
own platform, maybe even starting with leveraging data from their own systems, whether it be HR or IT or parts of their own supply chain management systems, for example, that becomes a very important part of the equation. So that, that's a big common trend we're seeing. So lots of investment going in into building those kind of digital threads themselves. Um, I think the aspect of using open AI is great because it gives you a chance to try something very quickly in incubated houses, um, but then kind of doing that as a mass deployment where you got a lot of uh, confidential information, um, there's a lot of privacy um, rules around that, um, data residency rules, it, can, it kind of doesn't allow you to, to leverage it. So that's some trends, but then what I would say is, is imagine marketing content creation where you want to create an innovative video and it could be to promote a new idea you have. There's nothing stopping you from using OpenAI to quickly whip up a new video that kind of really explains the message you want to get out there and you're moving away from a slide creation but to a really cool video. And that aspect I think is still uh, very much um, within people's mindsets because they're learning at the same time. We're all learning how we could use all of these tools. So I'd say it's, it, it kind of depends on the industry, but that build of digital core I would say is across the board. I think you also said it uh, well at the beginning because you were talking about the models themselves and making sure that the models have the good information and not bad information because sometimes, you know, with, with chat GPT or others, you know, it's it's trained on models that you don't control. And so if you if you do want to be able to make sure that you're you're creating not just you know, for, for creation sakes, but for a specific purpose that you make sure that the data you want is actually in it and it's data that you can control. So it, the integrity of the data stays because, you know, one of the things that we do worry about on the security side is um, model poisoning, basically, where you do plant something in there and then completely skews all of your results. And so, and especially as you mentioned, a, a lot of the, you know, the data privacy, you know, we work with a lot of personal information in the financial services world. So, you know, you, you also have a lot of models that are open and, you know, we've we've already seen hacks against some of those models as well, where, you know, you know, some some of your search terms, you know, are just showing up and, you know, maybe you're embarrassed by their search terms at this point, but, but you know, you've been able to uh, you've been able to see where if you are putting this information out there, it it is out there and it's outside of your control. And so if you really want to use it for for very um, distinct purposes, you might want to have your own model. If I can just add one more point, I think um, we shouldn't underestimate the aspect of cultural change. Um, here, you know, we want to create environments for people to test and try and feel excited about what new technology brings, but it's also quite scary. People are worried about what does this then mean for their own roles and all divisions and teams. So, you know, there's also that big aspect to consider as part of this whole like change management of doing something very differently in, inside a business. So very small steps there, I would say. Yes, in the back. Hi, my name is Gaynor O'Flynn. Uh, my company is Being Human. We work in the Createx sector. I'm just wondering, even anecdotally, given because I'm on the investor journey at the moment and the statistics are so horrific for women, if you've any positive stories from Barcelona about women in this space, and it could just be anecdotal, anything at all, really, particularly, I guess, around investment for women and just awareness of women and women's initiatives we could all get behind, Anything at all, really, that can just help change the gender imbalance in the sector? Um, I was actually at a coffee cart <laughs> at the MWC, and the lady in front of me turns around and, you know, she just randomly just introduces herself. I, you know, I gave her, you know, kudos for that, you know, to have the courage to do that and, and just come up to a complete stranger. Uh, we were waiting a long time in the line, but, um, and she was an entrepreneur from India who had came all the way over to Spain and um, she was looking into sports technology as well. And it was, it was really interesting talking to her, but, um, you know, I, I, I did find it you know, refreshing that, first of all, you have a young female who was, you know, brave enough to kind of say hello to a stranger, but also she was by herself. She came all the way over and, um, you know, she was able to, um, you know, try to do this in order to get funding for um, what she was doing. And, you know, we we connected on LinkedIn, LinkedIn afterwards and everything, but 
it, to me, that was a success story because um, maybe she didn't leave with a lot of investors, but she she made the effort. And I think it shows that there is a lot of entrepreneurship for females, especially in the developing countries that are taking advantage of things like MWC. And hopefully those of us who are at MWC can give them a helping hand as well. And, and just maybe an observation from my side, um, if I rewind back eight years ago, was women topic at Mobile World Congress even a thing? I would say no. Um, but now, fast forward eight years forward, definitely yes. So this time I saw pop-ups of different um, women in um, um, networking or women in telecoms, women in cloud, you know, those types of a smaller incubated events were definitely there. I saw them to be piggybacked on, on the back of some other networking events that were taking place. I think the cloud service providers have got a big role to play in this just naturally because they're good homes for a more diverse balance naturally. So, um, so I'm thinking that since they played a bigger role in an event like Mobile World Congress, we're starting to see a change. But even with GSMA this year, they had a focus on women as well. So I'm seeing that that aspect is changing. I haven't quite made a, uh, a personal observation on the investor side for female founders in particular. But I think the fact that it's on top of mind and there are focused events for people to come and meet key strategic leaders, I think that's a fantastic thing. Great. Um, my name is Janet. I'm a portfolio uh, non-executive. Um, I sit on four boards, all technology from AI simulation, uh, cybersecurity, semiconductors, and aerospace. And I'm just blown away by the talent and confidence and knowledge of the panel. It's really fascinating. One of the things I do, I also sit on the UK government uh, advisory panel for semiconductors, and a common theme through all of them is getting female talent to actually go into the industry. Um, you go to event women, the sort of 13 to 18 year old, and they're saying, why you tell me why I should spend time with you rather than the bank, the, you know, all the other things that are available to them. Uh, and I wondered, what would your advice be to a 13 to 18 year old um, to encourage them and give them confidence that um, your journey is one that they could make as well? Sophie, you're really close to it. So um, <laughs> why don't you start? <laughs> I uh, I actually did a video, I think for it was for UK TIN, but it was about careers and connectivity. Um, and, you know, even in that, I mentioned look, my I could never imagine, I didn't imagine a career in technology or even telecoms. Um, I didn't know, I don't know how I got here, but uh, it, it's amazing. And I'm so, I'm so passionate about it. And, and I want to make a difference, and especially as a woman. And, and I'll be honest here, you know, this is sort of the first time for me public speaking, but you've all made me feel very welcome and, and comfortable. And I'm so happy about that. So that's what I want to encourage that more and say, look, don't be afraid to try it. You never know where you'll end up. I didn't know I'd be here. And, you know, working at Digital Catapult and especially when, within telecoms and something I'm so passionate about, I'm so glad I made the choice. Um. A few words from me, I would probably say, um, look, I started my career um, as a systems engineer and I was the first female to roll out broadband network for London Underground. So I spent majority of my days walking the tunnels, doing line testing and a lot of dusty places with the rats. And I must say that um, when I went to the zone six sites to do those um, download and upload speed testing, there wasn't even a, a washroom for a female. It was only a Mel's urinal. So I got to have, I guess, an experience of what it really felt like to be in the minority. But I must say that um, I haven't lost my passion for technology. I see it as a, a path to change people's lives and businesses. And just with that feeling, um, I'm excited about what the future can, can drive and can bring people who would never have been able to do a certain job before, whether they are disabled or whether they are a minor or whether they're working remotely. I'm a mom of a two-year-old. Never did I think that I would have had the flexibility to do the job that I do today running this large organization. So that keeps me powered up, I would say. 
and those are the words that I would also encourage people. We have a amount, good amount of flexibility in this industry and we get to create the path for the future and I can't imagine anything more exciting than that. I'll just add that I, I have three teenage daughters. And so this is something that, you know, I have considered as they start to go on their journey of figuring out what to study. And, and um, you know, I, I would say, though, as for my personal journey, I did not start out in, in STEM. And so I did the, the social sciences route, and then I ended up in cyber. And so um, it's never too late. So you don't have to be 13 year old uh, to uh, go into um, uh, science or engineering. And, you know, you can do it on later on in life, too. But I would say if, if somebody was young, what I tell my daughters is, you know, um, no matter what you want to study, uh, as long as it's not philosophy, um, that you, you, you please, uh, <laughs> that you please, you know, still pay attention to technology and pay attention to what's going on. And I think the young today are, are really just embracing technology more than, than, you know, we did. And, um, you know, I think, I, I think they have an advantage in that sense, but at the same time, um, maybe also a little bit of a naivety about, um, you know, just how much it, it is and uh you know how 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 much it gets you into the public space and into the public domain and we've seen unfortunately a lot of bad cases where young teenagers um ha have been susceptible in in those areas and so i think <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, but be able to uh, be able to really un no matter what you study just um you know just keep up with the technology but but make sure you also keep being aware of um uh, of how it can and how it can be used for harm as well and and protect yourself i have two teenage daughters and uh, well they're now in their 20s and i wanted them to go into technology and they would look at what i did and there's no way they wanted to do what i did and now one of them is in technology running marketing. <laughs> and I think my advice is we need as parents, teachers, educators, neighbors, we have to encourage them because nobody talks about these jobs. They have an expectation that they're going to be walking in a, a tunnel <laughs> in the underground, you know, having to look at wires and they're not going to be able to be as uh, n nicely dressed as need to. Or they don't really understand what jobs entail. I mean, I hear that all the time, but what do you do? And I think we have to be able to be much more broad about uh, the variety of things that are available because if they don't hear it from us where it's going to come from. I believe we have one more question in the back. Oh, um, well, I was going to say, um, my name's Frankie, um, and I am a serial MWC goer for over a decade now. Um, I'm a strategist in the industry and I started a trade body for MVNOs 15 years ago as we were lobbying to allow the MNOs to provide access to their network. And in response to your question, I, you know, it's it's a hard road. And also the European investment bank and the european innovation council have a lot of money right now and they have structured some investment vehicles that do not necessarily take um ownership and shares from the founders which are very interesting and they've got a lot of money to be spending and at the last two major events mwc and uh, web summit they were there doing a call to female founders saying if you have not spoken to us please come and do so great thank you for sharing that super uh very last question of the night very quickly what are your bets for the themes for next year you got to if you were in the marketing department, what are we going to hear about next year at Mobile World Congress? Sophie. Um, uh, let's make a bet of, we spoke about satellites today. Let's let's talk about satellites and the telecoms industry. We know what's next. So it'll probably be 6G and beyond. <laughs> well, you guys definitely know better than I, but I would say probably AI and, and emerging technology, maybe quantum uh, more and more as well. Me too. Yeah, I would definitely say that AI is going to be back. I think this year was just a start. So lots more on AI, maybe more focus on real use cases because they kind of been implemented and had a run for 12 months or so. So maybe some practicality and realism around these theories um, across the board. 
Good. Well, I hopefully we'll get to see you walking the halls next year. Could you please give me a good hand for these lovely ladies? Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to announce if you haven't or if you don't follow GSMA tomorrow, actually at noon, they're going to have a live stream of an industry report on mobile money. So right up your alley that's coming out. And also they have their net zero um, state of the industry on climate action that's just come out. Some really good materials from the conference. So if of interest, let you know. Also, if uh, this was interesting for you, we have a lot more lined up for this year. So on May 23rd, we're going to be at Bird and Bird Law Firm, and we will be talking about the future of telco. We thought we'd do a kind of go back to our roots a little bit more and talk uh, in a bit more depth about um, where the future is. And I think, Annette, you're going to be running that one? Very good. Okay. And um, watch out. We're arranging for our summer party. Uh, we have our annual night at the movies which will be on the 27th of september we have on november 12th our women in tech entrepreneurial conference so our schedule is getting lined up for the year please take a look and with that i want to say a very warm thank you for our second year in a row here at digital catapult linda it's been an absolute pleasure thank you thank you yes Thank you very much to our amazing guest panel. Definitely, I agree, lots of talent in the room tonight. We've heard about um, 5G and, and different connectivity, convergent terrestrial space connectivity. We heard about artificial intelligence, fraud, open APIs, collaboration and inclusivity, which for us is definitely a very hot topic and something where we want to do more. So um, I would like to say again, a big thank you for Women in Telecoms and Technology for making this, ev this event happen tonight. For all of you for participating today and also our audience online, uh, thank you for staying with us. There will be definitely more events organized by us. We do all, all the time events across all technologies, but it will be definitely more also from uh, Sony Labs as well especially online as we tend to target to a very global audience. Um, so, and for those who are here tonight, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we have prepared a tour of the Sony lab. So there will be, my colleagues will obviously escort you to the lab and then uh, we'll end with some uh, uh, networking session and drinks. So again, a big thank you and um, yeah, just enjoy the night and make new connections. <laughs>